Well, I think we should get started then. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Kerry McCallum, and I'm the Director of the News and Media Research Centre here at the University of Canberra. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, who are the traditional, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet uh, at the University of Canberra, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Somebody's got the microphone and is typing furiously. Can you please all type to so just a few ground rules before we start. Um, if everybody could mute their um, microphones while they're um, not speaking and remember to unmute when they do want to speak. You can also use the chat function throughout the event. So today it's my great pleasure to launch this NNMRC report, which has been written by Professor Matthew O'Neill and his team of international collaborators. It's part of a high quality empirical and innovative report uh, series produced by our centre, um, which are available open source, of course, um, on the NNMRC website. Uh, the report, however, this one breaks a bit of new ground for the NNMRC. Its topic, the production of open source software, how it's portrayed um, by IT media and IT firm employees, its design and its collaboration, um, with Matthew's uh, Digital Commons Policy Council, all make this one a slightly fresh and different report for the NNMRC. So it's been a long journey for Matthew starting way back in 2010 when he launched the Journal of Peer Production, a do-it-yourself peer-reviewed online journal seeking to explore the production of digital commons, what we know as resources created and maintained by collectives who make their own rules. Issue 10 of the Journal of Peer Production in 2017 was on work and peer production. It was edited by Matthew and Stefano Zaccaroli, a computer scientist and ex-Debian project leader. Matthew and Zach surveyed the workers in the Debian FOSS project. And then to, to address the gap in research about open source projects, they teamed up with Laura Maselli from Telecom Paris. So when the, when the Ford and Sloan Foundation put out a call for research proposals on the sustainability of digital infrastructures, it seemed like this call for, for research had been written just for this team. So the story goes, their bid was successful and they were the only grantees from the Southern Hemisphere. Matthew was the lead with his team of international collaborators. Um, the project and the report we are launching tonight wouldn't have existed without the support of Ford and Sloan uh, Foundation and a Ford Foundation workshop Matthew attended in New York City in 2019. The funding is, has supported the collaboration between Matthew and his team of Australian and French researchers. So we'd like to also and importantly recognise the contribution of two outstanding research associates, Jalan Chai um, from the University of Canberra and Fred Paler in Paris, who unfortunately can't be here today. So what's the report about? The co-production digital infrastructure project considered a, a complex phenomenon, how the giant IT firms, which animate our digital life, are building into their projects free and open source software and infrastructure often organized by non-firm employees. The report asks, what does co-production mean for the future sustainability of these projects? So it's the first comprehensive study of this underexplored area. I won't go into the methodology, Matthew can let you know um, how they approached it. But just to say that it combined computational analyses of firm employee contributions on the GitHub um, development platform, analyses of articles in IT news media and ethnographic fieldwork. Importantly, this report not only explores co-production, but provides context and alternatives to the directions that, it, that we're heading in at the moment. It also breaks new ground by introducing for the first time perspectives on the digital commons from France to an English speaking audience. So I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. It gives me great pleasure to officially launch the co-production of open source software by volunteers and big tech firms by Matthew, Dr. Matthew O'Neill, Dr. Laura Maselli and Dr. Stefano Zaccaroli. Now um, I'll hand over to Matthew, I think to begin. Um, who will outline some of the key findings and will then coordinate a Q&A session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, 
Kerry, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I'd like to as well pay my, pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land and on which we sit, and also give my thanks to the Ford and Sloan Foundation and to the report designer, Zita, who's not with us, who's worked really well and for a long time and had to listen to all my changes and requests. So thank you, to Zita. Um, so this is a, a long, long project, and we've been working on this since early 2019. Um, so quite a, quite, a, quite a journey for us, and I'm really glad that uh, we've come to this far and that we've come up with these, these results. Um, I'm not sure if I, I can't see everybody who's here, but thanks to everybody who's, who's come. So what are we going to do? We're just going to take you through some of the pages of the report um, briefly, uh, different aspects, and uh, then uh, we'll have a debate, a Q&A, uh, based on some of the questions that we have and some of the for, uh, further research that, we, uh, that we're suggesting should be done. So um, let's see if I can move forward. Yeah, so this is the summary. Uh, these are the contents, so it's actually better if it, you look at it at two pages, but I, I'll tell that this looks better. So here are some of the key findings. Um, um, so what we've done is we've surveyed uh, GitHub, and by looking at the email addresses of committers, people who make code changes to GitHub, we can tell whether they're employed by a firm because they've got a, at Microsoft.com um, you know, email address, for example, and we can uh, measure how much each firm is contributing. So, of course, Microsoft bought GitHub in 2018, and it's maximizing its investment, and it's by far contributing the most uh, over the period of the summit, which was 2015 to 2019. Um, we've also surveyed the uh, IT media to see how they were defining um, the co-production by firms and projects. And so there's a word cloud based on the articles that we've surveyed. And uh, we've also done some ethnography at conferences. So I'll, I'll present the first two parts of the research, which is on GitHub and uh, IT media. And then Laure will talk about the uh, conferences and the discourses. And Zach, Stefano, will talk about some further research. So we've got an introduction, which is basically just situating the scene. Um, and how open source software, free and open source was adopted by firms. So there's a short history. Uh, there's some uh, key enablers such as GitHub, Stack Overflow and the Linux Foundation, which acts as a mediator between the world of free software and uh, industry. And then there's this uh, new value proposition, which is changing things, which is uh, cloud computing and software as a service. And instead of downloading a program onto your computer, you're now uh, logging into a remote server. So this does not trigger the reciprocal or sharing nature of soft free software, free and open source software. So it's quite a, a change and a threat to open source. And I'm not sure if she's here, but I saw that Cecilia Recap uh, registered. Uh, that was uh, really nice to see that she'd done this because I, I've never met this uh, person, but. Uh, she wrote an article, she co an article, which we refer to at the bottom here, uh, Big Tech Knowledge Predation and Implication for Development, which is about patents. So it's a similar uh, parallel kind of um, approach than what we have. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure, once again, I'm not sure if uh, Cecilia is with us, but uh, if she is, I'd like to be great if she could contribute to her later in the Q&A. Um, and so we, this is about the, uh, what I just said about the, the service, software as a service. And another contribution of the report is because it's a Franco-Australian <clears throat> collaboration, we thought it would be interesting to get some uh, comments from the French specialists. And so we have a lot of uh, different voices from academia, from uh, industry, and from activism with the Formosoft in particular. And so it's uh, one of the contributions is to introduce English speaking people to these uh, voices and alternative services that are not so well known as advanced. So hopefully that will be uh, that will be useful as well. So here's an example: Sébastien Bocard, who's a great colleague, and he's uh, written an article about um, sort of introducing introducing these issues. 
So I'm going to try and go really quick. So apologies if it's too quick, but um, you know we've only got uh, ten minutes. Uh, well, ten minutes to go go through two chapters. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we just selected some repositories on GitHub, which is a collaborative uh, code development platform where everybody's contribution is visible. So it's kind of a way for developers to show their competencies and they they even get recruited or uh, from GitHub. Um, so these are the top firm contributors. You can see that Microsoft contributions uh, commit uh, employee, Microsoft employee contribution dwarf everyone else's. Uh, this is the number of repositories that are contribu contributed to by firms. So once again, Microsoft uh, by Google uh, contributes to a lot. Um, and then you can see, this is interesting. This is how many uh, what's the proportion of firm contributions in a particular project? So Linux, Torval uh, Linux is of course the central hub with uh, you know, 300, uh, more than 300,000 commits uh, of which 73% were firm main. But if you see the last column, um, the, uh, the leading firm, which was Intel was only 0.07%. So that means that there's a huge diversity of contributors to Linux. By opposition to other, uh, if you look at uh, Spring projects, uh, you can see that Pivotal is contributing almost 90%, uh, or um, uh, VS Code, so Microsoft is contributing 70%. So that gives us some indication as well about the degree of control that firms can exercise on the projects. Um, the, uh, the bottom graph is a bit uh, hard to read, but it's basically the same information with the uh, the percentage of the uh, amount of control that firms have, the amount of contribution that firms have inside project. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, so we measured the source lines of code or SWOC, which is the amount of source code that is in a commit to show how to, to figure out how um, important the commits were, the different contributions were. Uh, we also looked at, we compared individual uh, contributions. So the uh, the big finding here is that firm employee in red contribute, uh, you know, they, um, okay, so there's another, <laughs> there's been another mistake, unfortunately, oh my goodness, this, well, everything's been, okay, so the top one doesn't look right, but the bottom one looks right, so um, I'm not quite sure how this happened, but the uh, firm employees dip during the weekend, whereas the non-firm employees remain constant, um, so, yep. Hopefully this is the top one is correct. It doesn't look correct to me. So sorry if that's wrong. We've had some little problems with legends. Um, here's another finding about the amount of contribution. And here you can see that firm employee contributions have increased tremendously over the period that we've surveyed, which is 2015 to 2019. We did some network analysis, um, which shows that um, Linux is the central node as we already knew and that there's a minority of firms contributing and a minority of projects receiving these contributions. Now, this is based on our sample, which is the most active, 135 most active repositories on GitHub. If we had a, a different sample, we would have found a very different um, results. And we were interested in the, uh, the repositories on GitHub that have the most activity. We also looked at individual contributors, either by email domains or, uh, or by, uh, by single people. And we're interested in seeing when people or uh, contributors use both firm email domains and uh, non firm email domains. So this is quite detailed. I'm not going to have time to go into, uh, into, the, uh, into, into the, the weeds of this, but one of the questions is um, that we haven't answered, I guess, is uh, if somebody is using, is, if there's a similar contributor is contributing Sometimes with a firm email domain, sometimes as a volunteer. Is it because they're contributing to other projects which their firm doesn't want them to? Or is it because for some other reasons? So obviously we don't have all the, all the answers yet, but we have got some information about um, the fact that there is a very small minority of people, if you look at the bottom table, which are disproportionately contributing. Um, so yeah, that's what I've just been talking about, top contributors using both firm and non-firm accounts. So the conclusion is that um, there are, uh, there's a huge amount of uh, activity on the part of people who are employed by firms. 
However, there's still also a lot of volunteer contributions. So firms in some ways are uh, using the contributions of, of volunteers. Uh, does it, you know, so I'm not going to go into the analysis, you know, whether that's a form of exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. That's not the point. Here, I'm just describing the data. Uh, so this is an interesting comment by uh, Hervé Le Clavier, who talks about the fact that um, design is very important and that uh, free software, free and open source software with a solution is only uh, functional and it doesn't take into account the design aspect. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this uh, Digital Commons Policy Council, you know, I thought there should be a, a think tank for the commons and I thought it should look as good as or even better than what the Linux Foundation does, for example. Okay, very briefly, we wanted to see how car production and volunteer labor is representing the IT media. Um, I'm almost out of time. So we looked at three online platforms and we, um, once again, we found some terms to research, so 50 terms of projects, 50 terms of firms, and we found some um, labor related terms to try and narrow down. So the table 3.4 shows you this total unique articles. There's firm, there's articles that talk about firms that comprise both firm and project terms, and then there's articles that comprise firm and project terms and labor intensive terms. And these are the top articles that we've got, and you can see how many labor related terms there are. And basically, uh, sorry, this is a uh, cloud which I already showed you. So you can see the central issues are data and cloud, Microsoft and Linux are the central actors. Um, yeah, so basically the uh, firms discuss uh, co-production in terms of career opportunities and in terms of um, a unified community, which is exactly the same discourse as firms, as, a, as, a, and as the Linux Foundation, there's one community and we're all in it together. So the issues of free labor, the issue of volunteer labor, it's just not talked about at all. Um, so here are some firms uh, which are portrayed negatively by the IT media. Uh, so Huawei, Apple, and that's the, um, and Microsoft. And so that's the amount of times firms are mentioned in the IT media. And so you can see Microsoft is uh, mentioned a lot, but Apple isn't. So Microsoft being mentioned a lot might explain why it's got a lot of negative connotations, but what about Apple? Um, and finally, here's a table that compares the, um, the mention, uh, the, 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 the size, the contributions and the importance of firms on GitHub and then the representation in the media. You can see that some firms are very important on GitHub, such as, uh, for example, Alibaba, um, Huawei, but they're not represented in the media as much, probably because it's an Anglo-centric kind of uh, form. Um, but there's other reasons which, we, which are explained in the report. Okay, and I'm going to pass over to Mark, and sorry if I spoke too much. Okay, you have to unmute, Laura. You have to unmute, unmute. Okay, so um, at this stage of the project, we, have to, uh, we aim to have a better understanding of firm open source uh, project relationship. So to do so, we used a mixed method approach combining first ethnographies conducted during open source conferences, and second, quantitative firm employee discourse analysis based on abstracts of speeches given at these conferences. So we found that the discourses of firm employee and foundation representatives are divided into two camps. On one side, we have large IT firms, in other words, GAFAM, and for-profit foundations such as the Linux Foundation, whose discourses are aligned. On the other side, we've got small IT firms such as Matrix or Nextcloud that were absent from our GitHub sample, that are companies that provide uh, interoperable and decentralized, and decentralized platforms and services whose discourses are aligned with those of nonprofit foundations. So their discourses differ on three main themes, digital architecture, business Perfect. of labor, and firm community relationship. 
So uh, regarding digital architecture, uh, for big ITs, the aim is twofold. First, developing open technical standards, which are less risky and costly. And second, making open source technologies acceptable for commercial users. So this gives rise to, to the professionalization of projects, which intends mainly to improve in software performance, quality, and safety. Uh, here, interestingly, in their discourses, employees of big IT firms never mention the data business, while their own business model is precisely based on data collection, storage, and exploitations. For small IT firms and non-profit foundations, technology must be efficient, but it must also serve independence. So they have a critical discourse which questions the monopolistic management of data on centralized infrastructures controlled by large, by large IT firms and also on free riding. So they raise ethical issues that include open source control by big IT firms, its sustainability, but also personal data protection, for example. Uh, to them, for big IT firms, foundations seem to be collaboration and innovation enablers. Whereas for small IT firms and non-profit uh, foundations, they are rather guardians of open source principles and project independence. Now we got regarding business model and cost of la labor, what we can say is that employees of big IT firms claim the idea that there is no open source business model. That is to say, there is no way to generate revenue from development of open source software. They never mention developers' payments, as this is not an issue for such large IT firms that have the resources to invest at a loss in open source digital infrastructure development. On the contrary, small IT firm employee discourses hinge around the issue of sustainable business models, as their activity is mainly centered unlike larger IT firm, on the production of open source software and services, with charging users remaining the key issue. As a consequence, they explicitly raise software developer payment as an issue to the open source ecosystem sustainability, because the projects upon which these firms rely can only survive by finding resources to pay core developers before a community of volunteer developers joins and enriches this work. And finally, uh, regarding the firm community relationship, we noticed that big IT promote what we call the open source community myth. This is the idea that there would be a unified open source community, which firms are part of, and relationships within this community are productive and beneficial for all parties involved. Here, uh, the importance of open source principles and licenses is downplayed in favor of collaborative development. In contrast, small IT firms or nonprofit foundations do not refer to the community, but they rather distinct communities associated to specific projects, which are differentiated by the values they share. So such community can dissolve or migrate to another project in case of conflicts occurring from changes in value, in values. Um, for such small IT firms and non-profit foundations, the respect of open source principles and licenses is particularly sensitive. So uh, now I'm going to hand over to Zach, who will address, I think, more in detail sustainability issue and the role of university contributors. Thanks, Laura. So yes, uh, I kept just a few words about one of the topics we plan to explore next. So a big event in uh, open source security and in general in uh, IT security happened in 2014. So you might have read about it also in, uh, uh, in general uh, media. It was called Art Bleed. And it was essentially the, a bug, a security bug that um, opened up to risk of attacks, the IT infrastructure of half of the world. And this specific bug, Heartbleed, was actually a bug in a specific piece of open source software called OpenSSL that turns out was used at the time, but 
all the big players, the, the GAFAM, you, you name the, the, the usual suspect there. But at the same time, that piece of software was, was developer was developed only by a very few developers, uh, volunteer developers around the world. So as in the case of free riding that Laura was mentioning before, this event actually uh, made the awareness of how much IT infrastructure relies on piece of software that are under maintained by volunteers around the world and was a big shock in professional IT around the world. Since then, this was in 2014, there's been a significant growth of the discourse around the sustainability of open source. So this idea that if um, economic actors depend on specific pieces of open source software, those pieces of open source software need to be well maintained. And well maintained usually means that the people developing them must be paid somehow. So this discourse has been very much uh, co-opted by uh, a discourse in which uh, we, only, we can only rely on uh, for-profit business models for paying developers that are maintaining these pieces of open source software. So there is an, um, a low understanding of the role of other actors. So the idea is mainly that if we are depending on some piece of software, we should really hire those people in big companies, or maybe those people should be consultant and actually uh, <clears throat> themselves offer the services on, on the market for being paid for, for their maintenance work. But there are other actors that actually exist. For instance, there are civil servants that are paid by countries to contribute to open source software. And there are researchers that as part of their uh, research outcomes also produce and maintain scientific software which is used on the market. So what we want to explore is actually this role, in, in particular of researcher, the role they play in maintaining key pieces of software. So in the current uh, field of innovation, so there are some pretty important scientific related software that plays a, a relevant role and are usually maintained by researchers. I'm thinking mostly about um, inter artificial intelligence, AI, in which even the, the big players, even the GAFAM have realized that they cannot by themselves produce all the innovation and all the software development that is needed to keep up with the pace of innovation there. And so there are significant contribution coming from universities, being them public or private uh, in uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world. So the, essentially following the same methodology we have followed for the research that has went into this report, what we plan to do next is uh, conducting a both qualitative and quantitative exploration of the role that university and research uh, at and researcher at university in general are um, given to key pieces of open source software that are using for uh, doing uh, AI. This is in the form of uh, uh, frameworks used for doing machine learning and for doing deep learning. Uh, there are popular frameworks out there that are for the most part uh, open source. There is a more general ecosystem of scientific software using for implementing data science, for instance. And in all those uh, key pieces of open source software, uh, we are going to explore what is the essentially the share of contribution that are made by researchers, that are made by a for-profit company and that are made for, by volunteers and actually document that to inform the public discourse. So we don't know yet of what we will find, of course, but the idea is that if it turns out that there is an important role uh, played by research in maintaining these key pieces of software, well, this should be taken into account when in general we discuss about, we discuss about uh, open source sustainability. So this is one of the key topics where uh, we are up to study next. Thanks. Thank you, Zach. Um, so just a, a little bit of information about the availability of the, of the report. Yes, it will be available. However, we've had some uh, delays in the production. So it's not gonna be uh, available today publicly. Uh, we've got a DOI, but um, it, the DOI will be live tomorrow. So what we can do, uh, if people uh, want, the people who registered, you will have a world exclusive and we can uh, email it to you, for example, if you like. Uh, so maybe just, um, you know, uh, say in the link or you can wait until tomorrow and I'll give the, I'll post the DOI uh, to the uh, chat. So uh, apologies about that. We've had some, uh, we've had some issues with late last minute kind of uh, tweaks. So um, I think we're running a little bit behind, probably because uh, I was talking too much at the beginning. Um, so I guess what I want to do now, I just want to go quickly over the uh, final two chapters of the report. So the first one is about strategic responses to appropriation and free running. I can hear somebody typing. Uh, make sure your mics are turned off, please.
Um, thanks. So the general idea is that there's an imbalance between what big tech or GAFAM, GAFAM is a French acronym, which is uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and uh, Microsoft, I guess, or Apple and Amazon could be into that. Uh, so we, there are some strategies that we propose. So we are talking about um, uh, you know, tracking the behavior, making it better known to the public, uh, fostering a debate in free and open source software about predation or appropriation and the recognition of volunteer labor. Uh, there are some alternative services, federated solutions, which we present by the French company, uh, French uh, organization Framasoft. So to what extent are these viable alternatives? So in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, they are viable alternatives for things like functional tools, like pads, collaborative pads, um, you know, uh, video conference tools like Jitsi, those work fine, right? Uh, but they wouldn't be so effective for content, for, you know, video. Like if you have a, a network of a trusted other people, a federated network, you, you cannot have the same variety, diversity, richness of content that you would have on YouTube. So I think for some things, they're really good, but for other things, they're, they're, not, they're not competitive. Um, but, you know, in any case, they need to be tested, they need to be, there needs to be a discussion. And um, yeah, also, I guess one of the big questions that uh, we've been interested in for a long time is about the, this question of uh, labor, of volunteer labor, and its place in society, and uh, in the context of growing automation, less work, less employment, um, maybe the place of volunteer labor, the, the sort of work that people are doing for free, should be socially recognized, not just informally through uh, careers, through learning, through uh, job opportunities, the way it is now compensated, but in, in a more organized, structured way. And, uh, you know, of course, this is a, a discussion which uh, contradicts some of the precepts of uh, free and open software, but uh, we have a strategy to, um, to engage. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, yeah, so just to track exactly, so this is basically what I've been saying. So to track exactly uh, what's going on, you know, uh, we could have a wiki where people uh, share information about uh, what, what exactly, you know, uh, which companies are doing what, because we don't really know what's going on. So we've done a first step to track uh, involvement, production, but in terms of use, we don't, we're not sure. In terms of having a debate in you know, open source software, um, the uh, special issue of the journal of reproduction in 2017 had a survey in Dublin with about 1,400 responses. This was published as an article in an academic journal in 2020, and the results were published in the journal in 2017. So it was never published as a nice report. So what we're going to do is we're going to publish this survey as a nice report, to give back to the community, to Dublin, and use that as an opportunity to engage in some more uh, some more uh, dialogue with the community, uh, do another report and uh, figure out what their opinions are about these sorts of things. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the uh, effectiveness of alternative digital services and the recognition of uh, volunteer labor by the state. Uh, Zach's already talked about the contributions of researchers. So that's something that we're already doing at the moment because we've already got the data sets from GitHub. So we can easily, uh, with, and we're expanding those data sets to uh, deal with uh, AI, as was mentioned by uh, Zach. So we will do the same sort of measuring of contributions and we're hoping to release that next year. And finally, in terms of identifying free writing firms, that is to say firms that use resources without giving back, uh, you can also, um, we have a little, uh, little technique that we are giving here. So um, one of the costs, I mean, okay, I'm not going to go to the cost of using open source, but you know, people can leave projects basically. You know, if you, have, if you rely on a project or your product as a firm, if the maintainer from that project decides, well, he doesn't want to work there anymore, well, what do you do? And so that's why the Linux Foundation and firms all insist on documentation, on proper practice, on security. All those issues are very important for them because they're dealing with non volunteers who don't care necessarily about those issues. So this is just a little technique. Um, you know, we, we've got the 50 firms um, uh, that we have found, and we can track to what extent uh, these firms are contributing to Linux. What extent uh, on GitHub? To what extent? To what extent they're contributing to GitHub, and to what extent they're representing the IT media? And you can see for the top IT firms, obviously they're doing all of that a lot. If you go down the list, you can see that uh, a lot of these firms 
that are, you know, obviously using the products because they're all relying on uh, cloud computing, which is based on open source software, they're not contributing. So, you know, it's just a way if you wanted to have a discussion about how this is being produced and whether where the support is going, this is one possible technique. And um, okay, so here's a comment, a long comment by uh, Pierre Gosset from Framasoc, who discusses uh, the, why they created this uh, this organization and the kind of services and philosophy they promote. And finally, uh, we have a final chapter which presents some debates uh, around the recognition of unpaid volunteer labor and uh, universal basic income, money and force and licenses. So uh, basically what I just said, uh, why should there be recognition of volunteer labor? Uh, they, I will give the example of a Japanese uh, system called Furia Kipo, uh, which is um, basically when you look after an old person, you, get, uh, you, can, um, you can earn some credit points, which then give you some, uh, some, uh, some rights, you know, some social rights. So this is not, this is a personal, it's a rival good. It's not something that's, uh, Everybody, but you know, it's, it shows the way that there are methods that you can use. Um, yeah, and basically, uh, as it says here, the crisis of measure, these proposals are being put forward because wage labor is not necessarily the best way to deal with the production of digital commons, which involves thousands of contribution. Uh, you know, what if some contributions are massive, others are tiny, so how do you measure them? How do you compensate? So that's why debates like in universal basis income are being had. Uh, some people are against it, some people are for it. There's also the question of how it affects women in particular. Should social services be expanded instead? So these are just, these are just some related questions that uh, we think should be, uh, should be debated more. Also the question of money in FOSS, money in free and open source software. It's a taboo topic. Um, you know, usually people do this because it's a passion, it's, uh, it's what they love, so you shouldn't talk about money. Uh, and also uh, some of the founders of the FOSS philosophy uh, always talk about, um, you know, uh, the fact that you should, uh, you, you should basically uh, consider free and open source software as something uh, that is, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to find my words here, but I can't even think. Um, oh yeah, clueless reformative. Free software should consider software and resources upon which users have certain rights, that is to say access, not as product of a labor that deserves monetary retribution. So that's a big thing. And so when people try to, back, to push back against this, um, when the open source firm Redis try to push back against Amazon, uh, they were really hammered by uh, big hitters in the open source community. So this, is a, this philosophy is really ingrained and uh, that's why we want to have this debate in uh, starting with Debian, and so we'll use the survey. And finally, the question of licenses. So there's um, you know proposals to separate actors and uses. If you if you're uh, you know depending on what you're going to do, you should maybe be charged differently. Uh, there are some proposals like the pre-production license, and uh, there's also trademark-based contracts which are proposed by uh, Benjamin Jean of the Ino3 firm, and we have some contributions by. Uh, Celia Guzon Daniel, Benjamin Jean, and Camille Moulin, to, uh, to, you know, that, that, that also talks about federation. So, um, this is a summary of the way the, the means that we use to collect the data uh, according to the different da data sets uh, GitHub data set, uh, IT media data set, the presentation summaries that we scraped from uh, two of the uh, open source conferences, uh, open source uh, in Lyon and FOSTEM. The email list that there, we didn't talk about that, but we also looked at the some of these discourses from firms, they present an email list, uh, ethnographic data set when we went in person to some of the conferences. And then we did also a little bit of sentiment analysis, and we also did some um, semantic network mapping uh, that was uh, Fred, Fred Payet's contribution, the right method. Uh, so these are some of the graphs that I showed you before, which basically breaks down discourses into clusters. And finally, um, the research efforts. So uh, that's all from me. And um, I mean, ideally, uh, we could now have a Q&A where uh, people could uh, put their hand up. Um, we have a moderator or write questions. And uh, you know, maybe using some of these recommendations as a basis. Uh, you know, uh, this is some of the things we propose. Uh, so you know the. The, the awareness of the role of open source software and free and open source software in the digital economy, 
the viability of said radio alternatives, uh, the role of researchers, as Zach pointed out, you know, there's a narrative that the only way you can support open source software is through, uh, you know, startups and entrepreneurial and uh, private companies. But, you know, there are researchers who are actually contributing a lot, so that, that changes the narrative a little bit. And finally, this sort of basic, uh, sort of more fundamental question of the uh, connections between the digital uh, commons and institutions, which are, they could be problematic, they, they could be uh, issues with, you know, uh, people of uh, different cultures or, um, uh, you know, problems. But uh, I think if we, if we want to move forward uh, as a society, then we need to, uh, to approach these questions. So that's it for me. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes, I guess, to have a debate, a QA. and a If there's any questions, um, please just uh, uh, could you, could you use the chat or, or just uh, speak up. No questions? Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks. So I assume I can't see, but this is, I recognize Denise, right? It's Denise. Yes, me. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I suspect that a lot of the uh, other grantees that have to check exactly what they're doing, but I suspect it's more about, you know, bringing people up to, to wider, to, to have more diversity and uh, more, to widen the contributor base, which is in, in fact quite not completely dissimilar to what firms are saying themselves in, in conferences, right? No. Uh, you know, the, having more jet diversity, having a more inclusive uh, policies, having more diverse language, that's pretty much the discourse that firms are pushing themselves in, in the conferences. So um, I'm not, uh, the, the question of universal basic income is, is kind of completely outside of these, of these considerations. And that's why uh, we wanted to put it in there because, um, you know, we, we, we wanted to step outside the, the accepted kind of uh, areas that that, uh, that, are, that are being promoted by, by other other players. Yeah. Kind of like that difference between the kind of boardroom feminism versus more of like a feminist economics approach, which is like reimagining an entire way of sort of like organizing labor through a kind of feminist feminist paradigm. So anyway, I've, I've hogged the mic. Thank you so much. Thanks, Denise. So may just a quick comment and find on that. So very interesting question. So in, uh, in unrelated studies from, from this report, I've actually uh, did a um, large scale analysis of the, can you hear me? Could you yeah. talk? No, but I can hear you, but who are you? Yes, I knew Denise, but I don't know. Oh, I, I'm Zach. Oh, Zach, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's your, your yeah, but you're right. I, it's I have a voice extinction extinction problem going on right now, so it's normal that you didn't recognize That's my right. voice. Oh, and, and you you were behind some boxes, so you actually you're, no, no. I actually have a voice extinction going on no, no, for no, a few days. Yep. So I I monitored the uh, large scale evolution of how the ratio of contribution by uh, men and women evolve over time. And I've seen that it's getting more diverse, but it's still abysmal. So like only uh, the amount of contribution by female authors only reached 10% last year. But from given starting from your question, Denise, I think it would be interesting to distinguish the contribution coming from um, employees, from those coming from non-employees, and see if the ratio of gender contributions are different in one case or another. So seeing if they're really contributing, as they claim they are, to increase the gender diversity in contribution to, to open source software. That's a very intriguing question, which can be, uh, of course, be related to other contribution of other correlation that can be studies around, you know, basic income on the kind of stuff. But that's a very interesting idea. Thank you. No, that that sounds really fascinating. Thank you. Thanks, Zach. Apologies for the blindness. Rob, Rob's got his hand up. So please, uh, Rob Ackland from the ANU. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, um, uh, Matthew and colleagues. It's a really interesting report. Um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know whether this is really a question or just a comment or a rant, um, but I guess I'm interested in the work that you've done on um, sustainability of open source projects. And I'd be interested, I guess, to hear or to know to what extent your opinion is that um, the involvement of um, big corporations such as Microsoft has um, in some ways affected the sustainability of projects because of open source projects because uh, as you know I mean a, a motivation of contributing to open source you know a major aspect of it has been intrinsic motivation and as someone who's been using open source and contributing to open source via the R, R project for um a long time, you know, I, I find it kind of disheartening um, to know that Microsoft, when they bought GitHub, for example, it was just kind of a bit of a shock because I know that um, basically Microsoft, um, they have a, a record of buying things and then just making them that little bit worse until then they, they, they eventually just get removed. You know, it's happened with Skype and it's happened with other things. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you think um, the involvement of these large corporations might be affecting sustainability because it basically leads leads to other people becoming less motivated to contribute because they feel that they're no longer you know part of a social movement they're part of they're, 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 they're contributing to a commercial software ecosystem rather than than open source or it's open source in name but no longer in nature um, so I guess that's my question or comment. 
I'm going to I'm going to ask Zach to respond, but I want to preface his response by saying two things. First of all, uh, I think the free and open source software is a very diverse field. There's people with very different opinions, and some people are quite political and activists, and some people, you know, they've just been brought up and uh, it's become normal to use open source software, and uh, that's that's the norm, and they don't think any, you know, it's just become for them. It's just the the way things are, but they, they don't question, uh, you know, the involvement of firms, the big corporation. That, that's one thing, you know, remember that the open source community is very diverse. And the other thing is, it, it's interesting in relation to GitHub. And um, the, the reason that one of the things that, uh, that happened with GitHub, I guess, is that because GitHub was, became so important for so many projects, it, it, because it's a centralized node, a centralized hub, it, it it's super difficult to leave it because so much happens on GitHub. And so I guess a lot of people would have been shocked as well, thinking, oh my God, you know, uh, this is, I mean, not to say GitHub has always been a private company, right? Of course, it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a collective or an association or anything. But, uh, you know, Microsoft buying it was pretty, pretty, pretty symbolic of, of something. But because of, because of the centralized nature, uh, you just, they just, there was no alternative, basically. Or there are, there are some alternatives for older projects, uh, which existed before GitHub, which set up before GitHub. But yeah, so that, that's the two things. Like I said, but I'm sure Zach can comment as well, and, and Noah as well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, let, just commenting. So yeah, very good point about the the, the generalization. It's very hard to generalize at this scale, so that you will find very different different opinion on this topic. But I think the the other point I want to make here is that. Uh, there's been an evolution over time. So for, there are a lot of studies on motivation for your uh, for participating into open source and free software development that historically have been uh, putting forward the intrinsic motivation of people participating. But since then, there has been also a professionalization of people doing open source. So there are a lot of people that are hired by big companies and basically they develop software as they did before open source was a thing. It's just very, you know, a cathedral to use the, the metaphor, the historical metaphor. So they, they work day day, they, they develop software. We just happen at the end, uh, in the end, to be released as open source software. So it is open source in license. It doesn't mean that development of the software is based on a community at all, for any notion of community one. And I think most of the, well, not most, but a lot of the open source software, which is developed by those companies, actually open source just in license and not in terms of collaboration. So if all the developers contributing to that are employees, their motivation will be very different from the historical intrinsic motivation that you were referring to. So I'm aware of some recent studies on developer, mo on developer motivation. Uh, I haven't yet seen this shift uh, reported in studies, but I think for sure it's something that would be interesting monitoring. Of course, it's difficult to do that in a representative way. So because your, your sample you use to you know, interview people, so depending on how much employees you have in there and how much volunteer, it will skew your answers a lot. So I think it's pretty difficult to have gotten a general answer. But I think a big part of, your, of the answer to your question is that things have evolved over time. And now we have much more professional than we used to have in the early days of open source. And I guess another thing is going back to what Law was saying about the field of firms, um, because there are two very different discourses. And um, you know, one of the commenters sort of questioned our division between the 5016 and 5013 foundations, the sort of not for profit foundations, and the industrial consortium of foundations on the other. But they were pretty clearly connecting to these different discourses. So, uh, Big firms uh, really talk about, you know, professionalization, um, you know, and uh, documentation and all those things. But the small firms have a much more critical discourse. And so, um, you know, we had a discussion with Laura about, you know, who cares about these small firms? You know, they, they, their weight is negligible. But Laura was saying, well, you know, people might have said that about Linux back in the 90s. You know, it was, it was negligible, but look what happened since. So we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is, there is, um, there are some tensions and there are some, uh, some things happening in the firm field, not just in the project field, because a lot of these firms, these small firms, they produce open source software themselves. So they, they, their sustainability model depends on, uh, you know, um, uh, the business model depends on, on projects being sustainable. Whereas uh, big firms have, have a much more utilitarian and uh, almost uh, parasitic relationship. You know, they just get what they want from it. 
and they, you know, they don't want them to fail because but they don't really care, right? So there are all these tensions, but maybe Locke can say more about that, if you um, want. What I would say, actually, is that, um, uh, yes, what small firms say is that open source will exist, but what is open source? And actually, they address the fact that um, uh, if, if companies contribute and if companies are too much involved and dominate uh, open source, they are going to change the values, actually, of the project, the values of open source, and they are not going to enforce the open source uh, principles that uh, lie into the, the licenses, actually. So that's, that's they fear, and this is why uh, they try to promote uh, alternative, decentralized, and um, um, many altern alternative and decentralized um, uh, platforms just to... Uh, uh, to compete against those uh, big, uh, big plat dominating platforms. Okay, hope that answers the question, Rob. Okay, so uh, are there any other comments, questions, or interventions? Uh, Marlene, uh, hi, can you please yes. uh, um, can you just say where, where you're calling from, please? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm listening from Germany. It's morning where I'm at. Um, thank you very much for organizing this conference and for letting me be part of it. Um, I've just started working in a research project as a PhD student and our research project is on um, what sounds a bit fancy but um, probably isn't um, functional equivalence to, intellect, to intellectual property in the digital economy. So what this means is um, we're looking for ways in which uh, software and web service companies uh, employ different means to restrict access or the usage uh, of their producers, basically, in a way that is not um, employed as intellectual property, but things that are functionally equivalent to that. Um, so um, my question is, we, we, we are just at the beginning of our project, but already at this point, um, it's, it seems to us that the co-production of open source software by volunteers has a large part in creating revenues for, for big tech companies. Um, so my question would be, in what way do you think the requirement of open source software and that being co-produced by volunteers has to do with the change in the intellectual property regime for software companies, especially for big tech? Sorry if that's a bit complicated. Um, well, but I would be really interested in what your research has to say for that. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm not sure that I can answer, but I, what I can say is that uh, it used to be the case that, you know, big corporations would um, be scared of open licenses, but they've adopted them now. So uh, there are some ways in which, um, you know, open licenses could uh, be that, you know what, what, what we say in the report is that the the, um, the uh, ethical and moral values of open source are not translated into licenses because the licenses refuse to discriminate between users, and um, yeah. that's what that's why the proposals such as the uh, cop uh, copy file for example uh, discriminate between communal uh, cooperatives and uh, commercial firms use of open source. So that would have the, uh, sorry, uh, use of code. So that would have the disadvantage of treating a tiny little firm and a giant corporation uh, the same, but it has the merit of clarity because there are other proposals by um, Primavera di Filippi uh, and her co-author, which I can't remember, sorry, uh, which are um, uh, commons clause, I think they call it, where they, you know, they want to measure exactly uh, who's doing what and it's sort of, creates all these problems about, you know, how do you measure the, uh, what's going on? How do you convert the rate of exchange? I mean, just read the, the report, it, it, it's, it's a sort of summarizing there. But um, yeah, I think uh, that, that's been one of the key changes uh, on the part of firms is this adoption there, there uh, of, of open source license. You know, they used to resist. And then a couple of years ago, uh, Microsoft joined the Open Innovation Network which yeah. basically protects, uh, as you probably know, which protects Linux against uh, frivolous patents, uh, like uh, what happened to GNOME. So they've completely changed their position and they've kind of uh, 
using these open licenses now in a way. But once again, and this is, comes back to what Rob was saying, uh, which is what Microsoft has always done, is, is to take something and then to move it a little bit to make it uh, you know, less shareable. And uh, this is particularly what's happening now with the uh, software as a service, which takes a shared resource and then changes its nature by putting it on a remote server and not yeah. giving access to the code anymore. So yeah. Um, exactly. The problem is, I guess, one of the, the problems is that uh, because of the professionalization that Zach mentioned, um, uh, the, the, the fact of being paid to produce code is, is not uh, is just completely normal now. And uh, there's, a, there's been a kind of interpenetration. Uh, the Linux Foundation has played an incredibly important role in uh, popularizing the notion that the firms and the projects are all part of this unified community. Um, and so the, the discourse environment is very, it's very uh, sort of um, anti-critical. And um, I suppose um, one of the things that we're trying to do here is to try and open up perspectives a little bit and try and have more uh, opportunities to have discussions about what's going on. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe other people want to, want to respond as well. Yeah. But thank it, you for coming have... anyway. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much um, for your answer. If you could um, somehow um, give me that paper that you mentioned um, in, in your answer just now, um, send it to me, that would be, would be really great. Well, you can look in the report. Um, okay. So references in the report at the end of this uh, bibliography at the, the chapter six, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for coming, good to have you. Some more questions in the chat. Uh, oh, Ned Rossito, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Matthew and team. A really substantial and unique report. I'll be sure to segment my colleagues and friends. And David Nolan, thanks, Matthew and team. Great report. Congratulations. So thanks, guys. Uh, Jurate, superb. Thank you. Uh, Marlene said, the agreed the report makes great. Please keep in touch with us about the research for like this. Uh, Fandu, the work is great for everybody. It's uh, complimentary. So, see. Design is actually the most important thing. That's why that's why I think you know, something that looks nice will get everybody's attention. And um, yeah, no, I mean it's actually quite important to to, to, to have uh, to be taken seriously. Um, and that's always a tension for me. Uh, whenever I've done things, it's the tension between making it as uh, authentic and uh, unique as a as a you know and, and representative uh, of do it yourself kind of people want to do. And then also making it look as good as possible. And uh, in this case, uh, I don't know, I, I resisted the temptation to write a slogan on the back of the report uh, until today. I, I had this slogan in my head and uh, we had to redo uh, the report for a 15th time. And I'm almost that close to getting the slogan, but I thought not the politicians won't take it seriously otherwise, but not that they'll look at it. Um, so, I think we all unveil the slogan. Okay, um, well, it's just about, well, it's actually uh, something as well about the, the purpose of doing this. And I, I think that's a good way to finish. Um, you know, a concept that I'm very fond of these days is the attention economy. Uh, we're constantly bombarded with requests for attention uh, every day. There's claims and claims and claims. So the slogan was pay attention to what you pay attention to. Uh, but it's a bit obscure, but it's also the question of, you know, what's the point of agitating, doing these sorts of things? Uh, it's just going to be a blip, disappear. Uh, so that's a question I've asked myself a lot, but I think at least what we've done is we've documented something the best way we could. And, um, we, you know, this is what's going on. We've, we've made a picture, we've made a snapshot, and uh, we did it in the, the most uh, realistic and, and uh, clear way. And I think that's a contribution. So even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't change the single uh, regulator's mind or do it change any corporations at least, we, we know that we've done the best we could in terms of documenting what's, what's happening in this field. So I think that that's good enough. Um, I think we're out of time. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't mind talking more, but I think I don't want to keep you uh, guys. It's already late here in Australia at seven. So thank you so much. Uh, if there's no more questions, I think uh, um, I don't think there are. So uh, thank you so much to Kerry for uh, supporting this and uh, for introducing and launching the report. Thanks to 
or the team, uh, Lord, did you want to have your final words, or Steph, or Zach, or no? Oh, no, just to say thanks. I forgot, I had my mute on before when I, thanks for the report again and um, and also for the response to my comment before. Yep. No worries. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I'm really uh, glad, uh, you know, really glad that we got people from um, from Europe, at least. Uh, the, the time is uh, difficult for people uh, in the States and uh, apologies for that, but, uh, you know, we, we all we had to balance uh, everybody. So hopefully if there's... Um, uh, Fandu, hey, there you go, you're, you're 4, 4 a.m., so you are very brave. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yes, so uh, it, the, the, this is going to be recorded, and of course the report will be available tomorrow uh, on the NMRC website and uh, on other uh, online platforms such as the APO and the uh, DCPC website, which will be live tomorrow. So thank you so much to everybody. And uh, I really, uh, really appreciate everybody taking the time to come. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, proud uh, of, this, of this work. And thanks to the team. No, Zach, Chalan, Fred, we've done, uh, we did it. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, bye thanks, bye. everybody.